The Kremlin is warning the United States of fatal consequences if Ukraine uses U.S.-provided weapons to attack Russia. Last week, the U.S. quietly gave Ukraine the green light to use its weapons to strike military targets within Russian territory. This comes as Russia ramps up attacks on Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. The assault began earlier last month when Russia launched a surprise attack on the northeast side of the city. Since then, the area has faced brutal daily offenses, including numerous airstrikes. This is drone footage of the smoke and the destruction to the infrastructure. Documenting this destruction is Oleksandra Matvichuk. She is a human rights lawyer and the founder of the Ukrainian human rights organization Center for Civil Liberties. She's been documenting war crimes against Ukraine for 10 years with a particular focus on Ukrainian children abducted by Russia. Matvichuk won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2022 for her work. She's now on a tour of Canada and met with the prime minister earlier today. You've done just incredible work uh, fighting for... Um accountability in the uh, horrific uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also more, uh, more specifically and nearer to my heart, uh, uh, fighting for the children who have been taken away uh, from their families, from their homes, from their language, from their culture, uh, and are, are too often the forgotten victims of, of conflicts like these. I spoke with Matt Vichuk before her meeting with the Prime Minister. Here's our conversation. Alexandra Matt Vichuk, welcome to the program. Thank you for the invitation. I want to start with what has been in the news, uh, in, these, in particular these last few days regarding Ukraine. The United States has said that Ukraine can use American-supplied weapons to strike targets inside Russia. How significant is that for the fight that Ukraine is waging right now? It's extremely significant. I will tell you, not from a military point of view, because I'm not a military expert, but from the human point of view. People in Kharkiv are regularly being shelled by Russian rockets, which were sent from Russian um, territory. And it takes 42 seconds to deliver this rocket from Belgorod to Kharkiv. For 42 seconds, you have no possibility even to hide. And that's why, in order to save peaceful cities and settlements in Kharkiv region and people's lives, Ukrainian people need to get this permission. One of the concerns has been about the consequences. Russia has warned of fatal consequences if Ukraine uses American weapons. How real do you believe that that threat is? I think that it's a wrong approach to be worried uh, to cross the red lines which Russia draws. Uh, it's Russia who have to be worried to cross the red lines because for decades Russia was proactive. Russia did some horrible things in Chechnya, in Georgia, in Mali, in Libya, in Syria, and then presented these things like a new reality and uh, push international community to reckon with it. We have to change this approach. International community has to be proactive. I, I want to ask you about the work that you have been doing inside Ukraine throughout this conflict. More than 72,000 cases of alleged war crimes so far. That's your organization, the regional groups you are working with. You have said you believe that that is just the tip of the iceberg. What is it that you want Canadians and the world to understand about what is happening inside Ukraine at this moment? Two things I want to the, the world to understand. First, unpunished evil girls. And now we are going through hell only because for decades Russia enjoyed impunity for war crimes which they committed in different countries. And now we are in a situation when Russians start to believe they can do whatever they want. And we must break the circle of impunity and demonstrate justice. Because justice is precondition to peace in our part of the world. And second thing, I want to international community to understand that people in Ukraine want peace, but occupation is a war, just in another form. Because when we speak about peace, we speak about freedom for people to live without fear of violence. But people in Russian occupation, they live in gray zone. They have no tools how to defend themselves, their rights, their freedoms, their property, their lives, and their beloved ones.
Are you saying then that there can be no, ultimately no negotiation, no discussion of Russia keeping claim to any of the territory that is, a pl um, that is taken over in Ukraine for this conflict to end? We have to understand and to accept the reality that Russia don't want peace. So if the negotiation will provide the a pass to peace, uh, we will be glad to have such negotiation. But Russia want to achieve their imperialist goals. And Russia sends the signals about negotiation to international community like a special operation to decrease the level of support of Ukraine. You speak passionately uh, when you talk about the cases that you and your colleagues have looked at of these alleged war crimes, um, that everyone has to understand that these are not just numbers, and they are horrifying numbers, as we just talked about, but that each of these is an individual story. I wonder, can you tell me about one individual you encountered to help people understand the gravity of what you're dealing with? Um, one month and a half, the father, Stepan Podolchak, was uh, illegally arrested in his own house by Russians. Uh, they turned everything in his house upside down. He, uh, they uh, took uh, Pastor um, with a bag on his head, barefooted, and after two days, uh, Russians told to his wife that Pastor Stepan Padalchak died. They tortured him to death only because uh, previously he refused to uh, transfer his church to Moscow Patriarchate. I want uh, people um, in international community to understand what does it mean to live under Russian occupation, even being a pastor. You have talked about the importance of justice in all of this, and also that it come in a timely fashion, that justice cannot wait for years. Obviously, Ukraine is in the midst of this invasion of this war right now. What would justice look like at this moment? When people speak about justice, they don't understand very important things. That justice has impact not just to the past, because you persecute people for something which they have already done. And justice has not just impact to future, like with this strong signal to people that if you will commit the same, you will be persecuted. Justice has a huge impact to present, because when even just we starting appropriate legal procedure to establish justice, um, even when part of Russians start to be in doubt that probably this time they will not avoid responsibility, even if part of Russians start to think like this, it will have a frozen effect to brutality of human rights violations. And because we speak about large-scale war, it means that we will save thousands, thousands, and thousands of lives. So, so what, that is what it would look like in terms of the message it would send. But you've said, for instance, that the I International Criminal Court is not equipped to deal with um, the number of cases that we're talking about here. So what would it look like? Well, I mean, through what system? You've talked about a special system. Through what system um, could justice be handed out at this moment? We have to develop a comprehensive justice strategy. The activity of International Criminal Court is extremely important. But first, International Criminal Court, unfortunately, have no jurisdiction to prosecute Putin and his surrounding for the crime of aggression. This means that we have established a special tribunal on aggression and hold them accountable. Because all atrocities which we are documenting, it's results of their leadership decision to start this war. Do you find that it is difficult to get international support for the kind of ideas that you're talking about when it comes to this justice? Unfortunately, yes. And let me explain why. Because people still look to the world through the lens of the Nuremberg trial, where Nazi war criminals were tried only after Nazi regime had collapsed. But we live in a new century. We cannot wait. Justice must be independent of the magnitude of Putin's regime's power we must establish special tribunal now. And what is your best hope for seeing that at this moment? As you say, you, you, it's a difficult case that you're making, one you've been making for a while. Where do you see the most hope? I think there's the most hope in the people. What do I mean? I know from my own experience, when you can't rely on the legal instruments, you can still rely on people.
because ordinary people have a much greater impact than they can even imagine and ways of millions of people in favor of justice can change the world history quicker than the UN intervention. One piece of the picture right now is the approximately 20,000 Ukrainian children who have been abducted by Russia since the start of the war. Uh, one count I saw suggested 388 of them have been returned. How realistic is it to imagine that a greater number of those children will be returned? We know this is something Canada is working on as well, but that we will see greater numbers of those children return while the conflict continues. Canada is a leader uh, of the international coalition of returning Ukrainian children home, and we people in Ukraine are very grateful. Uh, but there are a lot of other things which has to be done uh, to increase the efficiency of this process. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, to implement sanctions on the level of state members of this international coalition against people involving in this uh, policy. Second, we have to uh, call things what they are, because this illegal uh, deportation of Ukrainian children is not just war crime. It's a part of genocidal policy of Russian state because these Ukrainian children um, are bring up as Russians in adoptive Russian families. And third, uh, we have to um, establish international mechanism of identification of Ukrainian children in Russia. I mean, database with DNA and uh, appropriate uh, communication work. Uh, how to use third countries for returning Ukrainian children back. Obviously it is Ukrainians who are first and foremost feeling the brunt of this, but Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine has also been a test of, of the world, of the international community in many ways. How would you say the world has responded? Let me remind our audience that this war started not in February 2022, but in February 2014. And this was a time when the world failed test because the response for occupation of Crimea and then occupation of Luhansk and Donetsk region was so weak that Putin started to believe that they can do whatever they want. There is a good Russian proverb, the appetite grows during the lunch. And this weak response, this inactivity, um, increasing the appetite of uh, Russian empire. I hope that now, with unity, with international partners, uh, we will stop Putin in Ukraine and don't let him go further. You are going to go from the conversation we are having here shortly to meeting with Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. What is the most important thing that you hope to convey to him? Uh, for sure we will discuss issues of justice and um, uh, the problem of uh, illegal deportation of Ukrainian children to Russia, but frankly speaking, I will also uh, want to touch the point which is not my field of expertise but the truth is that in order to secure human rights in Ukraine we have to get weapons because it's the only way how to protect ourselves our country our people our democratic choice and our human dignity from Russian aggression. Are there specific weapons that you're seeking from Canada that Canada has not been forthcoming with until now? I think that Canada uh, already um, helped and can be um, also helpful in getting air defense system. We all expect in a very hard winter because Russia have already destroyed energy infrastructure in Ukraine. So assistance of Canada in this regard will be very essential. Alexandra Matvichuk, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.